good for experience. You don't get the feel of your hair.
So uh, we should get going here. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Russell Lepker from the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health at the School of Public Health. And I'm fortunate to introduce, and I, I, I did a count, the 18th Martinson Lecture. So this has been going on for some time. It's an endowed lecture devoted to issues of health promotion and disease prevention. Uh, things that were central to uh, Dr. Martinson's uh, beliefs in clinical practice. You see behind me, I think, right, Carl Martinson. Uh, Dr. Martinson was born in Stillwater in 1888 to Swedish immigrant parents. Uh, he graduated from Union College in Omaha uh, in 1913 and taught chemistry and physics in high school. Uh, for nine years, high school and college. Uh, while teaching in Chicago, he met uh, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg of Battle Creek, Michigan, who you may make other connections with beside the fact that he was a physician, who encouraged him to go to medical school, which he did, and he graduated from Loma Linda Medical School in 1925. After an internship at uh, uh, Los Angeles County Hospital. He went into practice and founded the Martinson Clinic in Minnetonka and practiced there over 40 years. Just a couple things about Dr. Martinson that uh, deserve, we deserve, uh, he deserves to have us uh, remember. Uh, he was long an advocate of good health habits, uh, an important lesson in the 20s as it is today. And importantly, beginning in 1927, uh, the clinic in Minnetonka was smoke-free. Uh, the people have heard me say this before. It took us until uh, 1985 for our hospital to do that, and it's just two years ago that we made this campus smoke-free. So clearly, Dr. Martinson was ahead of his time. We have uh, Tom Martinson here. Uh, from the of the family, uh, uh, Carl Martinson's grandson and Elmer Martinson's uh, son, and we're pleased to have have him join us today. We're also fortunate to have an excellent uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Lloyd Michener. Uh, Dr. Michener graduated from Oberlin College and Harvard Medical School, and then. He did a family residency, family medicine residency, and a fellowship at Duke, and he's never left Duke since then. But the water is rising, and so he may need to retreat. Uh, he, uh, I won't go into the many things that Dr. Michener has accomplished, but he is a leading figure in the integration of primary care and public health. Uh, he has. Uh, programs supported by the CDC, uh, by HRSA, uh, by the De Beaumont Foundation. He has multiple awards and honors for this uh, work uh, and chaired multiple professional groups for the CDC and other organizations. Uh, I noticed uh, because of our interest in aspirin that he has also been on the board of the Million Hearts Campaign and for those of you who have forgotten, the A in the Million Hearts campaign is aspirin. <laughs> and in conclusion, let me say, <laughs> where is our video for? Well, I didn't move anything. You know something, Jim? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't touch anything. <laughs> I mean, just, you mean dumping out water on the screen doesn't help it? It looks thirsty. Okay. <laughs> Moving forward. Uh, Dr. Michener is today is going to discuss, as you can see, uh, improving population health and reinforcing roles in public health, health systems, and the community. 
Welcome, Lloyd. Good morning, and first question, can you hear me okay? Okay. Well, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. I've been a fan of the University of Minnesota, and especially of John and the School of Public Health for a long time. I um, appreciate the introduction, and even the moving screens, because in a funny way, uh, that's a good metaphor for the space we're in, isn't it? Where things are moving around without us quite understanding why. The walls are changing, and we're not quite sure what to do about it. Um, so what I'd like to do for the next little bit is actually talk about some of those moving walls and some of the ways in which primary care and public health are changing and the way in that which that may, in fact, deeply touch the, the lives and work of everybody in this room. I do do this a bit, so I have two caveats. Um, one, if you go to the next slide, I, I need to formally note that I have no conflicts of interest. Um, I'm going to be sharing a lot of information from federal and other groups. Oops, maybe I need to advance it. I can do that. Oh, how about the other way? Ah, there we go. We're good. Um, so I'm going to be, everything I'm sharing is shared with permission, but any comments I make about it are mine alone. So please don't blame the people whose data I'm sharing or slides I'm using for the slides themselves, but you can for me if, if I, for the comments I make. The other is that um, this may seem a little odd to you um, because in talking about med public health and primary care and how we work together, it, it's like talking about a new hybrid language, a polygod language where you understand many of the words and even the sentences, and you think, yeah, yeah I know that. And then all of a sudden you understand, you don't have a, a, a slightest idea how, what that guy is saying or how I got there. So when that happens, please re re wave your hand and I'll back up and go over it again. It should happen several times. In fact, let me ask this particular group, would the students in the room just wave? I'm counting on you. When you go, what? Wave, okay? Anybody else can too. And just, again, to put a context, I'm a family doc at Duke, a tertiary care medical center. So I am used to folks wondering what I'm talking about. So feel free to go ahead and ask questions, make comments. Um, I'll be real comfortable. The other one is if you don't ask me questions in a couple of minutes, I'll start asking you questions. And this is actually timed, so we have time for interaction because this idea of medicine, primary care in particular, and public health partnering is not a new idea, but it is complex and it does have its issues. So we need to actually talk about it. We need to have that back and forth because otherwise it's just words and concepts. We actually have to make it real. And making it real is what I want to talk about. Uh, so first, I don't know if this is good news or bad news, but those of you who are conspiracy theorists, there actually is a plan. Um, I was part of the Department of Defense Health and Human Services planning group for around some years that actually had about 40 federal agencies involved with it. It was convened by the Department of Defense, and we'll come back to that, uh, about moving the dialogue in the United States from focusing on health care to focusing on health. Um, DOD tends to take planning very seriously, so they had very formal structured exercises looking at how you change culture, the role of strategy, process, and for this group, learning, learning, execution, and practice is things that we needed to learn to do across agencies and organizations. Um, it was a big group. In fact, that's many of the folks who are involved with this. Many of those are groups you would know. The type is fairly small. I didn't even try to fit them all, but there's some really interesting groups that are engaged in this discussion across agencies about moving from healthcare to health. Some of them you would expect, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'm at two, three minutes, so now I'm gonna start asking you questions. There are some other ones, though, that were interesting. Homeland Security. When I was at, at the Pentagon, we're talking about this in a room flat, but about this size. A gentleman from Homeland Security came up and said, Dr. Mitchell, we need to talk. Now, I don't know how you would react to that, but I didn't feel real comfortable. So my question was, why does someone from Homeland Security care about moving the discussion, the dialogue from healthcare to health? Anyone? Excuse me? Emergency preparedness was my first thought, and he said, that's good, but that's not the reason. 
Bingo. You're the first person in probably 15 sessions that knew that. It reduces the risk of radical terrorists. If you're a member of a marginalized group and you lose a loved one because of an illness that could have been prevented, you're likely to go over the edge and form a domestic terrorist cell. So Homeland Security is interested. Okay, let's do another one. Uh, Federal Reserve Bank. Why would the banks care? Anybody with financial background in this room? No, I would like to do the microphone Ah, can you make the uh, that I can't do. Can we make the microphone louder? I'll slip it up. If that doesn't up I'll, does that work? Okay. If that tell you what, we'll try another one. Does that work? No, okay. By the way, this is a metaphor for what you do. You keep trying until you get it right. We did that with medicine public health. So why do the banks care about getting, moving the dialogue? Healthcare is so expensive. Banks don't necessarily mind expensive. It's so close. Because they have a, their roots in economic development. It's part of their charter. Most folks don't know that it was the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco that first tumbled to the fact that actually it is economic development and they have some work to do because of the historic pattern of redlining and where they make loans. And they need to actually look at their policies and reinvest in health as a form of economic development. But it actually has roots in their charter. One more and then we'll move on. Department of Defense itself. DOD convened this meeting. Why would the Department of Defense, these are mostly one and two star generals, the surgeon generals of the department, why would they care about changing the, the civilian discussion from health care to health? Good. So the folks coming in, not sure you could have the, that's absolutely right. One reason, two good ones, two big ones. One of them is that the folks who are recruits, who mostly come from uh, rural, poor backgrounds, increasingly are not healthy. So there's a whole issue about how, would you, how do we have healthy uh, recruits? And that's one reason, there's another. Because it's very hard to have troops at full effectiveness if they're worried about the health of their loved ones at home. And it's very hard to have a healthy base if the base isn't in a healthy community, which is why there's a healthy basis program of the Department of Defense to engage, the how the, the DOD and its bases can partner with its surrounding communities to promote health. So multiple, I won't go through all of them, that takes the whole time, but multiple agencies coming together and saying, for the first time, how do we start linking policies and coordinating uh, around improving health? Um, that background work has led to multiple signs telling groups it's time for a change. Um, you don't have to read all the small points print there, I'll go over them. But key point here, especially for the healthcare professionals, the, the doctors, nurses, PAs, family docs in particular, basically, there's, I could have made it a stop sign. Stop, the road ends here. We are changing direction in how we're gonna pay for healthcare. It's part of that shifting from healthcare to health discussion. Um, but it's multiple agencies and groups. C Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services being one, Bill Kassler, who is a partner with us on the playbook, wrote something really interesting. We see CMS as playing a catalytic role, catalytic, by embedding population-based strategies in our programs and policies. CMS can help drive transformation that aligns healthcare systems with public health and social service systems and thereby accelerate progress toward improved health for our whole country, January 2015, New England Journal of Medicine. CMS gets it. They're looking at how fast they can drive change. Um, let me do another check. How many in this room know what MACRA is? Not what it stands for, but what it is. Good, you can explain it to me then. Um, but MACRA, in short, is a, by the way, those of you who didn't raise your hands, learn it. Because this is a major piece of policy that is changing how physicians, anybody who gets reimbursed paid, I shouldn't say reimbursed, but 
Medicare and Medicaid will be paid in the future, and it's moving us to value-based plans and risk models and requiring partnerships in order to achieve the outcomes that CMS is mandating. It's, it's going to go through some changes in evolution as always, but it has very broad support across both houses of Congress. It's the law, and it's actually already underway. So CMS is moving. Accountable health communities, I usually have to describe to people, except Minnesota has one, so I'll just note it. It was one of the, you had one of the early experiments in helping connect with social services and communities in need. Um, they, we haven't figured out, I don't think anybody's figured out how that fits in with uh, MACRA, but we'll figure it out as time goes on. <clears throat> and then CDC. Have you guys seen this one? CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, partnered with the Internal Revenue Service. Now, there's an idea. <laughs> CDC partnered with the Internal Revenue Service to rewrite the code for the requirements for nonprofit hospitals on what's called the Section 990 reporting. Hospitals know what that is. It's where they are required, mandated, to actually engage with their community, their public health department, to actually do community needs assessments to actually take that information and work with the community design plans to implement them and to evaluate and publicly report on the results. It's the law. Um, hospitals weren't sure it was real until they started losing their tax uh, nonprofit status because they weren't complying. So it, it's a major interest in where there are actually webinars going on nonstop in hospitals and health systems, nonprofits, about the requirements of Section 990. It was, law, it was heavily advised by CDC. And they actually have now done infographics, this is one, um, on invest in your community and the things to work on. Know what affects health. Focus on greatest need. Collaborate with others to maximize efforts. And use a balanced portfolio of investments for greatest impact. CDC now has a board game. No, wait, let me, say, let me stop. CDC has a board game called Meeting in a Box to help health systems learn how to do this. And actually, they're selling it. Um, and this is just, this, folks, this is a new world. Um, so if, I think you guys have a copy of that. It's actually really useful to help people in the early dialogues when you have different groups trying to learn to work together and they have no experience collaborating. Know about the 618 program? Anybody? Uh, this one, in particular, schools of public health should know. This is, uh, it's new. It came out about a, a few months ago. Uh, John Auerbach and Laura Seif in particular drove this. It's evidence-based interventions that states and payers can do that are known effective and cost-effective interventions that can be adopted into policy, things like insurance policies, so that they, they rather than trying to persuade insurance companies everybody should do things differently, you're saying, look, you got, you're in a new payment model, here's things you ought to use. You can just take this and use it. And they're rolling it out across states all over the U.S., and, um, and often to the payers. Blue Cross Blue Shield in North Carolina, for instance, is one of the groups we helped them hook up with. So, worth knowing about. And then, of course, states. It's not just fed, the feds. The real action is in states. Um, I realize I'm in Minnesota, so this is scarcely news to you. But the real ferment, the real exciting work is occurring at the state level. Uh, and all politics are local. This is a, a, a slide out of the National Academy for State Health Policy, NASHB. And it's their slide saying, here's what's going on. So these are all the policy wonks at the state. The Medicare, I'm sorry, the Medicaid director, the, the governor's staff. We need to be reorganizing care delivery to promote efficiency and quality, quality and encouraging teamwork, linking providers, and resources in communities. That's you. That's me, that's all of us together. This is the work of the states. This is the current map of every CMS, CMMI project to do that. Just map, the red box means it's statewide. The majority of the US population is in a CMS supported innovation project right now. And that's before MACRA hit. So most of the US population, all the states have some innovation project underway. By the way, how many Innovation projects and care delivery, care payment exist in, oh, let's make it easy, Minneapolis. Anybody? How many you got here? Give me one. John? Yeah, over at Northpoint. And what, do you know what type of program it is? Um, I think it may have something to do with bringing together social services and mental 
accountable health communities. You got one of the early grants. You have a state innovation model, um, which is actually one of the best ones out. You have a primary care redesign model. You're actually in one of the hotbeds of innovation. It's a really good place for schools of public health to be connecting in because the health care delivery system is reinventing itself uh, around population health and looking at how health outcomes are, can be improved. And as doctors do, we tend to be taking a medical approach and could use the help of figuring out that it's not all about doctors. I'll come back to that. But that's the, that's the map. Where if for all you, oh, good. Mickey. Question, Lloyd. Uh, that's a lot of projects. <laughs> so, so how do you think about that? Because I think it's really important that we have a strong I have, actually, I have the analysis a little bit later in the slide deck. Hold on to that. Yeah. The, um, it is actually, having talked to some of the CMS design team, I said, what, what was your strategy, your logic model in doing this? And, oh, it's very easy. It's called the spaghetti model. You throw it up on the wall and see what sticks. Um, and they were very upfront about it. So they would, said, we don't know what's going to work. So back to the trial and error, you, you try things. And some of the things they thought would work didn't. And some of the things that they didn't think would work did. And I'll just say, I'm going to go back to North Carolina and our own experience, we're 25 years into this redesign work. <laughs> Almost everything I thought would work to improve health outcome as a family doc didn't. Almost everything my students thought would work did. And everything my community thought would work did. It, was, it took me a while, I'm a slow learner, it took me a while to realize I, was, I needed to listen more. But this is the, you gotta try things and see what works, it's sometimes the only way you can learn. Okay. Um, let me shift a little bit. There, there are projects underway across the United States. You saw them. One of the things that's become clear is this is not linear. We talked about this a little bit in a working group here yesterday. It, it's a process. It's very much relationship-based. Um, and it starts actually with a group getting together and saying, you know, we can do better. We, we're better off working together than we are separately. And they organize and prepare. They gather some data. They don't get obsessed on all the data, but they go, you know, we could at least do X. And then they plan how to do it, they implement it, they monitor it. It's hard to tell if it worked if you don't monitor it, telling this group that. that oh, by the way, something we don't teach in schools of medicine or public health, they celebrate. Turns out the celebration is really important because if you don't have that sense of, wow, we got there, you don't have a lot of energy left to do the next one. So the celebration turns out to be key. And then you do it again, and you cycle, and you go up and down, and some things work and some don't. Again, 25 years into this in Durham, we probably have 40 projects ongoing at this point of tight integration, and all of them are in different stages of that cycle. The things that are barriers, looking across the US at several hundred projects, is actually our culture. We share a language of English, we share a language of health, but when public health and healthcare get together and we talk about improving health, what do doctors think that means? Improving the health of the people we see. That's probably not what you mean. So we've actually been able to unpack that we actually need to work on our language together and define terms. The playbook, which I'll talk about in a little bit, part of what has made that work, we've realized, is we use some traditions out of um, translation. We actually wrote sections and paragraphs and then would give them to medical groups and public health groups and say, what do you read? how do you read this? And then listen to what they said. We basically had them translate and then back translate it. And we realized that what we thought was crystal clear writing was rarely understood by the other side. And same with public health writing. So we had to do translation, back translation, and keep doing it until people from different, from medicine, public health, and the community reading it understood what we were trying to say. It was a lot harder than it looked. And that gets me back to please keep asking questions because I've been doing this long enough. I can slip still into medicine speak, occasionally public health speak, and you go, whoa, where'd you go? what did you say? So culture is an issue. The other one, though, is in every case we looked at, many, now probably over 500, there was, a, there was a bridge organization. There was a strength in that community. There was somebody who cared and had credibility across groups. Probably if they didn't have it, we didn't know nothing happened, we wouldn't have come to our attention. But there was always a strength in that community that served as a bridge. And the key was finding out who that was. Sometimes it was the public health director. Or that was one of the more common. Sometimes it's community lead, sometimes it's elected official, sometimes it's a trusted family doc. But there always was somebody that got it going. So barriers are our language, facilitators are bridge organizations. 
Mickey's been waiting for this one, I expect. Um, one of the things we also found is, ideally, not always, the process actually begins with data. It begins with asking your communities, your communities, what they think is important. Not telling them what, what's important, not telling them what you know should be important, but actually asking them what, what are the outcomes they care about and how that might be measured. So our colleague Sergio Grillo-Gaxiola did one on universe, unified taxonomy of health indicators. Um, let me just pause for a minute and ask my FP colleagues, how many metrics are you measured on right now? Let's make it easy. How many of you have under 100? No hands. How many of you are between 100 and 200? How many of you are probably somewhere between 500 and 1,000? That's increasingly normal. The number of metrics that practicing family docs in particular get measured on are staggeringly high. They're usually close variants of each other and the, the, just the collection cost of that is staggering. So finding a small set of metrics that are common that our communities care about proves to be a key issue and we're working on it. So I've been talking about how it works. Let me talk about what it does. I'm going to shift into the, the practice. A little bit about Duke and Durham. Uh, Durham, North Carolina is a community about 270,000. It's a majority minority community. Demographics very similar to the U.S. Um, rapidly growing Latino community. Uh, it's different in that Duke actually owns or leases both hospitals. Um, we are very close to the federally qualified health center. We actually run Medicaid on my department for seven counties. So we have complete data capture in roughly 97% of the folks who live there. Now, if you make a mistaken judgment and you go to a, a medical sick group called University of North something, then we don't have your data, but that's your problem. Um, <laughs> God help you. Um, but other than that, we actually have the data, and of course our public health department has data, all the public health data. So we've actually been working with our health department to geomap data for more than a decade. So this is an actual, it's, act, it's old, geomap of everybody with hypertension from any site, any in, in Durham, North Carolina. It's just a scatter plot. And then we've overlaid it, starting to look at where the churches are. But you can have fun with this with where the liquor stores are. Um, and you can particularly have fun if you look at where the grocery stores aren't. Um, I'll give a clue away. So we've been gathering that data, looking at it, and looking at some of the hot spots and cold spots in that. Um, what we've realized as we do this is you actually need lots of folks looking at the map, because the medical groups all see medical patterns. The public health, of course, sees public health, and the community groups see different patterns at, entirely. So what you need to do is get groups around, and this comes from county health rankings, public health, business, healthcare, educators, government, community development, nonprofits, all looking at that and saying, what's going on here? What's on, what do we understand about our community, and do we have a common understanding of those patterns? The community groups are quick to come up with interpretations of data that even my public health colleagues didn't see coming. And this is what it actually looks like in reality. This is a social network analysis of Durham County done by one of our, our partners. We didn't do it. Uh, it just looks at um, a blue square is a partnership. Red circle represents organizations. Now, Durham is 270,000 people. Whenever three or more are gathered, we form a nonprofit. Um, so we have over 1,000 community organizations. Uh, just within obesity prevention, we probably have 50 organizations who you largely don't talk to each other, but then within Duke we probably have 15 and we don't talk to each other either. Um, we're working on that. But that's, that's the map. If you actually zoom in and look at it, there, there are three super nodes. One of them is Durham County Health Department and the other is Duke. And actually what we realize is what we're doing as we build capacity together is we're forming more nodal connections. And we're actually using social network analysis as one of our tools for mapping change in our community. We're, we're looking at the mean number of, of connections across nodes. Um, the other thing, by the way, this is useful for, since I have a public health analysis, is looking for isolated organizations, because there may be a project you're working on, and there's an organization out there that only has one connection, and one of the really cool strategies is to, be able to uh, deliberately, intentionally connect out to those other groups. And then you can evaluate it. And um, I thought I'd put in some comments about evaluation here, since I'm in Minnesota and Minneapolis. Um, how many of you know what a Clinical Translation Science Award is? Mickey does. OK, about a third. So those of you who don't, it's a major NIH initiative. 
Now, wait, let me say that again. It's a major National Institutes of Health initiative that actually has a, has a major grant program out. It's usually 30, 50, sometimes $80 million a year. These are the requirements if you want one of those awards. I put them right out of the RF, a community engagement, which communities may include but are not limited to nonprofit or ind industry in entities engaged in translational research and might include disease advocacy groups, local health providers, and community-based organizations or other national or, or local communities. The NIH is requiring community engagement for this. And this is what, and that includes how clinicians at healthcare facilities in the, in the community are integrated in the research enterprise as active partners. So the NIH is, start, is not starting to, has mandated that if you're gonna get one of these really big integrated awards on doing research, you actually have to engage the community and its community organization as a condition of getting the awards. And those who are not doing that are not getting funded. And these are sort of research methods that we're using within those awards. This is actually a slide from Duke. This is the research methodologies we use in working with our communities as a school of medicine. Any of these look familiar? Now, we're, okay, this, I'm gonna be on thin ice on that one, but it happens periodically. We have a pretty good school of public health nearby. To what extent would you think the Duke School of Medicine reaches out to the UNC School of Public Health for assistance in doing these sort of research studies? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So there's something funny going on here. On one hand, it's kind of good. On the other hand, it's actually a little worrisome because that means schools of medicine are getting NIH funding to develop research capacity with communities to do epi studies, to do dissemination studies, to do risk modeling and prediction. We're developing, and we have the data, because health systems, so we actually can do the risk modeling, modeling and analysis uh, on a health system side without working with schools of public health who have the innate long-term capacity to do that and do it well. Part of the reason I wanted to come here is I actually find that really scary because um, you do it well. On the other hand, unless we find a way to bridge, there may, this may be not just a lost opportunity, this may be actually a, a real problem in the making. Um, but my department, Community and Family Medicine, we have 19 epidemiologists. We have more epidemiologists than the state of North Carolina does. So this is, this is a concern about, on one hand, it's good for epidemiologists, because actually we pay pretty well. On the other hand, are, are we starting to shift the boundaries between medicine and public health in ways that actually may not be wise? And so I'm actually here, I actually think it's not wise. Um, I want to talk about how that may work. Um, by the way, we also do workforce development. So we're actually tr we're teaching in all those areas, and we're teaching medical students, nursing students, PA students, and community members in these methods. We train community health workers at Duke. So what do you do with all this? So let me give you some examples, because up now I've kind of been painting the background. Uh, again, we've been looking at data, working with community partners. This is one of our now famous uh, projects. We do Medicaid, I think I mentioned, we have the data. Um, and we got approached some years ago by the, the Seniors Council in Durham wanting to know why we weren't working with them around improving health outcomes for seniors. Said, well, no, wait, we've, we've been doing patient-centered medical homes in North Carolina for 15 years. We have great models for geriatrics. All, I mean, every, every senior in Durham has a medical home. You know, we've got pharmacists on staff, we're good. And they said, uh, not so fast. Uh, why don't you come visit? Um, so we actually visited one of the senior high rises, and, and they're called naturally occurring retirement communities. And what we found was, in fact, we did have folks who had doctors, but we never saw them, and they never saw us, because of course seniors often have medical problems, they often have problems with ability to move around. Um, so we rarely saw them. In fact, if we did see them, and my FP's colleagues will recognize this, they show up on Friday afternoon and they're not sure what's wrong with them except it's not good. Uh, and they didn't bring their medicines and you have no idea what's going on with them. So we, we group, worked with a group of medicine and, and school public health students and actually did a sweep through the first housing project and just talked to people. We found that one housing project, average age of, average 350, well they had 350 patients, average age of 70. Average number of uh, major medical problems was over 10. Um, 
44% had a major psychiatric diagnosis. All were homebound by definition, mostly African American. Most of them had never graduated from high school. Some of them had never graduated from elementary school. So very low literacy rates, um, functionally illiterate. Average income of $7,000. They had to pay $25,000 for rent, so they were living on $5,000 per year. So they got Meals for Wheels Monday through Friday. Meals for Wheels doesn't deliver in North Carolina on weekends, so that meant they didn't eat on weekends except whatever they could carry over from Meals on Wheels. These were our patients. Um, and I've been a family doctor in Durham for a long time, and I actually didn't know this. Um, they mostly got care in the ER. Not very good picture. What would you do with that? Well, the first thing to recognize is that's the wrong question. Um, the first question is to ask them what they would like done with, for them. So we actually can work with that senior group and talked about what would work for them. We said, with all due respect, you got to come to us. So what we did was put together a team of NPs, PAs, geriatric social worker, backed up by one of my faculty family docs. Uh, we did persuade Duke uh, Informatics IT group to put a uh, Wi-Fi system in the so that we could actually use electronic medical records and carry around a laptop so we could sync records back and forth. Um, and then we asked every patient to sign up, if they wished, uh, for an experimental program where we would bring a PA and NP to them to go to the door. They had to consent, and every uh, 349 consented, one didn't, and she was hallucinating. So I question whether her uh, consent would have been accurate. We got her care. Uh, then we required every doc consent and every single doc consented. Why would a, now, okay, for my FP colleagues, why would a physician agree to let somebody, a PRNP they have never met, see their patient for them? We said, look, we'll, back then, we'll, we'll send you an electronic copy, we'll fax it to you, we'll keep you posted, but we'll be, re so you can tell us if you, if you want us to do something different, but we'll tell you what our plan is. Everyone consented. Why did they consent? Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Uh, hold that thought. That's a very good point. In fact, this one didn't have many of the ministers and pastors involved. Uh, we'll come back to that. There, it shows up in a, more clearly in a different place. Um, but short answer to this, by the way, is they didn't see these patients anyway. So we just we put. Go ahead. I think there'd be two reasons. One is because it's the right thing to do. Good. So this is before any of that came about. So the, it was really, it's the right thing to do. We weren't seeing them anyway. So we put the PAs and NPs in. I'll come back to the church question early. Okay. And here's our outcomes at a year and a half. 68% reduction in inpatient costs and utilization. That's the same bed days that they, they map closely. All right, can anyone tell me something else? And for those who are in yesterday's workshop, shush. Um, Give me a public health intervention that reduces inpatient utilization by 68% in a year. There is one. It's not flu vaccine. It's not Pneumovax. It's polio vaccine. So this little action of bringing care to people at least on inpatient utilization, but polio vaccine, you avoid the whole illness. This one, though, had, a sim had an impact almost as much as polio vaccine by changing how we delivered care, by listening to the patients. Now, I would point out it did not save money. Um, what it did do is people started filling their prescriptions, home health care costs went up, but their hypertension and diabetes got controlled until last year, actually, this group of low-income minority women, functionally illiterate, had better hypertension control than the Duke faculty. So, so how we deliver care and how we put it together and who we listen to turns out to make a huge difference. I think I have, oh, we've done a variety of these. Um, I, don't, I didn't bring all them all. We did one on asthma. Asthma is actually my favorite because it's fairly easy. We did one of actually working with the parents and the kids. Um, uh, we got all the doctors, Duke, non-Duke, the primary care docs, the specialists, the allergists, the pulmonologists, they all agree on common metrics, on common interventions, we can see any, sh any shift in any of the outcomes. 
Um, despite all that work on common guidelines, on common documentation tool, we included the school nurses. Where are the kids during the day? They're in the school. So we included the school nurses in coordinated uh, algorithms for care. Very simple language, color-coded refrigerator magnets that we, we had on what to do with the different spirometer readings. When we included the school nurses in the integrated coordinated care pathway, Inpatient, uh, hosp I'm sorry, ER use for asthma plummeted so much the ER contact is assessment what we had done. In fact, we reduced ER utilization by over 60% in our target area. We scaled it up statewide. We're 65% statewide reduction in Medicaid, in, in uh, kids with asthma. And we'll talk later, um, it continues to scale up. City of Boston just hit 80% reduction. So 80% reduction. We're starting to think that asthma is actually a good marker of whether the healthcare system is working. Because it's, it's actually, you ought to be able to reduce it way down below current levels. We just know you could, could do it. And it's not just asthma. We've, we've now been tracking, this is Community Care of North Carolina, one of the older medical and uh, community-based health home models in the country. We're reducing all-cause admission across the state spectacularly. Um, it's about, oh, I think at this point we're about 800 um, admissions per year statewide that we can track that would have been avoided in, our, in the group being we, in which we're doing a coordinated care model versus those we don't. By the way, our coordinated care model statewide includes the health departments in every county. They're part of our team. So is the social services. So is behavioral health as part of our care model. It produces spectacular savings. This is a GAO audited financial report. Uh, blue is North Carolina, red is the adjoining states. Actually, it's US. These are actual per member per month payments. Um, and by the way, we pay on a fee for service basis uh, still. We're not a Medicaid expansion state. Um, it took us a couple years to figure it out. We made a lot of mistakes. Um, you can spend money to little avail. But once we got it down about using data, targeting interventions, designing those interventions with the folks who are trying to affect, um, we've been able to reduce costs in North Carolina on a PMPM basis by over $100 million per year, and every year we've been able to do better. You learn by doing it. Now, how many public health departments? We have public health departments involved in all across the state. We've not yet gotten our public health students involved. We do have medical students involved. In fact, this has become one of the hottest topics for medical students because they see this as their future. This way, carry design actually seems to really work well. And these projects have all been retrospective. Well, a little bit, I mean, we, we try some things, we look at them, they've been small, we scaled them up. Where we're at now is actually large-scale deployment. So this is now going national. There's, there's something called um, the Build Health Challenge uh, with Robert Johnson Foundation, Kresge Foundation, Colorado Health Foundation, De Beaumont Advisory Board. But our advisory board is a for-profit company. They put a million bucks in of their own money to be part of the team. It's about a $10 million program. It's to be bold, upstream, integrated, local, and data-driven. Cool title um, or acronym. Um, it actually requires or offers the opportunity for community-led groups. It has to be a community nonprofit, 501c3. Mandates that governmental public health has to be a partner. And healthcare, the local healthcare system has to be a partner. Grants are a quarter million dollars. The health system has to match the grant which is why, by the way, we didn't make it primary care alone because we figured they didn't have a quarter million dollars to put in. Um, but health system, and then they have to, had to propose an intervention that the community cared about. They had to have data about why it was a problem. They had to propose an intervention, and they had to show how they had tracked the outcome. And they had to show, make a case that would make a difference in two years. Wow, what a challenge. So the Catholic Hospital Association told us we were nuts. Nobody, I mean, it just, Quarter million dollars from a hospital to put into a community? To make a difference in two years, this was crazy. Uh, we actually overflowed the telephone lines from community groups who want, and health systems who wanted to learn about this. We did two web national webinars, made over two th almost 2,000 people on the webinars, 337 applications. Uh, we, it overwhelmed our, our sorting process, so we had to do a two-stage. 18 grantees at this point, they're just finishing their first year all over the country, none in this state. But we're doing things like food deserts, um, programs to reduce community violence, programs um, 
to reduce asthma. I'll talk about one of those in a minute. Just all over the country, a bunch in Colorado because Colorado Health Foundation all came in, but they're really about coordinated healthcare, public health, community-led interventions to see if we can make a difference. Uh, they just reported out the year one results recently. Nobody had staggering success yet, but they're just a year in. But what they were reporting was coalition forming and they're tapping into those new CMS measures for, for long-term sustainability. We're about to launch phase two. It'll come out at October 31. There'll be a new round of, of awards. Uh, you may actually want to look at it. would love to get schools of public health involved with that. We actually think it's the future. Uh, but we are requiring that the community organization be the lead. And everybody else, their medical school groups have really wanted in on saying that's fine, but you've got to work with the community to make sure folks are engaged. This is the sort of program that's actually underway. This is the story of Cleveland um, and asthma and housing. Cleveland's been mapping data. This comes out of their uh, planning commission on housing violations. They just, I mean, it's Cleveland. They, like most big cities, it has a problem with a crumbling urban core. They've been tracking growing rates of um, housing code violations. It gets some traction, but it didn't really get a lot of traction until the medical groups got involved. And then one of the hospitals actually mapped all their asthma and COPD admissions from the ER and put it on the same map. And lo and behold, there were three hotspots. All those housing code, all the housing projects, all those code violations, three of them also mapped to places they were getting almost the vast majority of the asthma COPD admissions. Anybody want to guess what was going on on those housing projects? Cockroaches. Good thought. That was Bronx. This group actually, we, we, we learned, you eventually learned. We said, well, maybe we should go talk to people who live there. Um, so they did, and actually there's a YouTube video up of folks walking through the housing projects. They're black with mold. All the services are covered with mold. Well, that's housing code violation. Okay, we think that's not news. But the fact that that was leading to all those kids and adults with asthma and COPD was news. So all of a sudden, the health system really cares as we move into value-based care. Rather than teaching people about how to use your inhaler and upping the meds, maybe we should clean up the housing. Um, the HUD violation. So the intervention here is actually to clean up the housing. Um, it's a coalition led by community groups, Stockyards, Clark, Fulton, Brooklyn Center, uh, housing, the Hispanic community, health departments right in the middle of that, Metro Health System, Cleveland Department of Health, um, and really looking at the interventions, what it costs, and whether it's a sustainable building model on that. Uh, several of these do have the churches involved. We did learn from North Carolina. I realized I didn't put this slide in. Uh, that we have to work with in communities that are have a strong religious foundation. You got to work with the with the churches, and sometimes that's even more interesting than working with the political parties. I'd add, um, because they have their own competition and issues. But you work with them, and they were part in several of these projects. And I mentioned. This is another one, the uh, Boston Children's, where they've reported out an 80% 80, 80 reduction in asthma admissions through the community coalition led with the, um, I think it's one of Boston Children as well as um, the health department in, in that coordination. So that takes us to the playbook. Um, what we've been doing, I'm sorry, that takes us to the IOM report, and then we'll do the playbook. So the Institute of Medicine was watching all this going on and said, you know, there's something here between healthcare and public health, and CDC and HRSA commissioned a study group to look at, is there something here? Is there something in integrating primary care and public health we need to attend to? We looked at examples all over the country, many of the ones we just, I just cited, and said, boy, there are a lot of these. In fact, we could find about 1,000 examples around the country going back over time, but very few of them were sustained. Um, the, and what was interesting was those who were sustained, there was a coalition that kept them going. Um, so that's our report on primary care and public health. But it, it went out, and like most reports, the question was, is anybody going to pick up and do anything about it? And then the de Beaumont Foundation with CDC, de Beaumont, Pete de Beaumont is uh, the guy who founded Brookstone, um, and he left his money to support public health. And the, the trustees went to meet with um, CDC leadership, Tom Frieden, and said, where do you think we should invest our funds? And he said, you should really need to explore this primary care public health space. It may actually be the future. So they invested several million dollars actually into a program to actually continue to survey the space of primary care public health. We work with CDC, ASTO, Associated State and Territorial Health Officers, NACHO, 
city and county health officers, but also the primary care groups, American Academy of Family Physicians, American Academy of Pediatrics in particular, to gather examples, vet them, make sure they're not of uh, advertising fluff, and then disseminate them. What we didn't anticipate when we started this um, is how fast it would grow. Within a year of launch, we had over 1,000 pages up. Uh, I mean, readers were busy writing, back translating, getting them up, and it quickly overwhelmed us. We just did not anticipate, the, one, the level of interest, or two, the number of examples. Um, so we actually had to take the site down about six months ago, completely rewrite it, um, and, and then relaunch it. We're at this point about uh, somewhere over 50,000 users, over a quarter million page views, and growing fairly rapidly. It's just, it's just growing like crazy. Um, working with a lot of medical groups and public health groups on that, including the Accreditation Council on Graduate Medical Education. Ah, now from my family medicine colleagues, why do we care about ACGME, as we call it? So ACGME is the credentialing body for residency programs, doctors after their initial training. And it turns out there's actually population health-based language in all the major specialties. Family medicine in particular has it. So what we've done with them is actually tease that out and said, you know, there are cores here in every specialty. But we had quite a, quite a discussion. Could anyone think of a medical group, medical specialty, that doesn't need to worry about population health at some level? Pathology. Everyone agree? Pathology is the, one of the national leaders in population health. You know, what? Well, I mean, how could that be? Well, think about what do pathologists do? I mean, if they're anatomic, they do autopsies. That's pretty well been replaced by imaging. They run labs. Ah, oh, we're going into the era of apples and on-site testing and consumer-based testing. The job of pathologists in the future is probably going to be providing advice to patients, groups, medical groups, public health groups about interpretation of lab data. So they, they've realized epi is going to be fundamental and they need to get into this population health space and they were one of the first groups to figure it out. I'm really impressed with them. Oh, there is one, by the way. Let's see if you can figure it out. Neurology? Neurology. Neurology. It's actually in there, and the reason has to do that patterns of neurological, neurologic injury turn and disease turn out to be place-based in significant part. So they realize, oh, the epi of neurology, neurologic disease is actually important. They need to attend to it. It's not cardiology. It's not nephrology. There's one. Oh, radiology. Uh, good question. And they're probably not one of the folks who've been most eager to do it, but it's actually in their language because, again, what's in radiology is really a study of imaging and understanding patterns of illness in different sectors and how you adjust your algorithms turns out to be important. The only one we really struggled with was plastic surgery. <laughs> Enough said. Uh, but that's, oh, go ahead. I think that was well said. Um, all we need to do is help, help, and I hope I'm not offending any plastic surgery colleagues. I realize this has been YouTube, but th that's been, medical groups vary in their enthusiasm for this. Let's leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not always as you predict. I would not have thought pathology would be one of the leaders, and yet they are. Family medicine, pediatrics have clearly got the bug and are moving fast with it. But let me, let me stop there and, and reflect on that. That means you've got major medical groups saying, we have to learn this population health stuff, and we have to figure out how to put it into practice. And where do they turn to in figuring out where to learn that? I hope it's folks in this room. No. And then the question I have is, how do we make that so it is? Because to train a group of doctors to do public health, we need a bunch. In fact, we need a lot of them. But for folks who are actually in practice, there's some degree of public health thinking, epi in particular, I'd add, some degree of statistics and informatics you need. But do we really need to train a whole, thousands of doctors to do that, or is there a way we can work with folks who really know what they're doing and do it together? I hope so. So how's my timing? Oh, good. So Mike McGinnis wrote the conclusion for the playbook. Um, actually, let me get to that one more comment, then I'm going to give you my exam. Um, 
I didn't, I didn't tell you about the exam. Um, it's especially for the students. Um, his comment is, it's not that we don't know that this is important. It's not that we don't know how to do it. What we, what we need is leadership, the partnership and the tools necessary to forge the links between primary care and public health. And I think that's what brings us all together, and I think that's a journey that we have been taking together, and I hope we will continue to, because this is the outcome. Um, it's from John Auerbach. It's really about healthcare, public health, and research coming together to figure out what works. I really appreciate your long-term leadership in this space, and I think most of the journey is yet ahead. Now, let me stop there and see if there are any questions, then I'm going to show you Actually, let me back up. The Duke Family Medicine residents all have to pass a final exam to show that they can effectively partner with community, including public health, in designing interventions that will improve health outcomes of whatever community they go to. I'm going to show you one of the exam questions and see what you do with it. Um, but before I do that, any questions or comments? Then there will be plenty of time for more. Was, that's an observation or a question. So that, that was an observation okay. and an assumption. The second thing, and the, the question that I really wanted to ask was about getting uh, care to everyone. And presumably in this uh, election, however it turns out, the Affordable Care Act is going to change. My observation about the Affordable Care Act is that uh, there's so many regulations with it <laughs> crazy because, well, you have to fit this criterion and that criterion. And I wonder how can we write a, a health care act which will provide health care to nearly everybody or everybody, which uh, I would think would provide guidelines for achievement rather than, you know, you have to do it this way or that way, and which would ultimately then come back to my first assumption which is getting the, the people in the field, uh, you know, the relatives, the friends, the community organizations, talking to people and getting them integrated. So really the question is about, is about what's going to happen to the affordable care. <laughs> how, can, how can we integrate your you want into them? Uh, could folks hear the question? Um, uh, <laughs> what's going to happen next? And beats me. Um, actually, let me, let me be a little bit more concrete. North Carolina is not a Medicaid expansion state. Um, if you're, it's, religion matters a lot here. If you're transgender, good luck finding a bathroom. Um, the, and yet this issue about getting health care to everyone in ways that works has been a major issue in our state. Um, and, it's, and it's true for every state, but for a funny reason. The uninsured are expensive because they don't get care until the last minute. Um, and actually, to, again, because we take care of 97% of the county, we actually run care of Medicaid and the uninsured as a line of business for our hospitals. Because it actually turns out, if you do these coordinated plans, it's actually cheaper to keep poor people healthy than it is to wait till they're sick. Now that goes against all common wisdom about prevention never pays, but it, it actually depends on how you do the prevention and what your strategies are and who does them. Having doctors do all the prevention work is incredibly expensive. Um, but we actually run community outreach clinics coordinated, designed by the community, by the churches. My, con my gentleman asked that question. We actually work with the church is to design them. Uh, and we do it specifically on hot spots of folks who don't have access to care. Um, and it's funded by the hospital for, out of economic, and their own economic analysis says it's cheaper to keep folks healthy in the community than wait till they're sick and see them in the ER. ERs are expensive. 
So we actually do it as a line of business. So there's a fundamental economic argument. We just didn't, have to know, didn't know how to say it. Now, how the Affordable Care Act is going to play out, and uh, if, if any of you don't know, the average family doc now spends more time documenting than, they, than we do seeing patients. So it just, it's nutsy, um, and I'm trying to excuse that. But change is co always complex, and you end up doing stu things that you learn are really bad, um, and we're in the middle of that. But that said, we, we tend to often focus on what's broken, and Lord knows there is a lot of that. Um, but I also think it's important to focus on where there are places that are doing well. And I think Minnesota is one of those, North Carolina's got some. And finding those examples that seem to work, because I think the real answer to the question of what's next is the medical, public health, business, wider communities coming together and saying, okay, this works, we all need to do it. And it's that learning what works together that's so so important now. Other, please. I want to use this opportunity to reach across the aisle. Please. 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 There you go, folks. It's time. It's, it is a good time. Actually, in yesterday's discussion, we called this the beer moment. Grab a beer together. Yeah, it's time to talk. Yeah, or whatever. Actually, tell everybody who you are. Yeah, go on. And you said me up beautifully, because this is about understanding communities, their needs, and the disparities within them. And if I've left you with any sense, by the way, that medicine's going to take over public health, and let me quickly dispel that with this map. This is actually my exam question. This is real data. It's from the state of Virginia. It's all payer database. It's every patient who was admitted to a hospital over, over I think, four years uh, to a hospital. So if you died at home, you're not in there. Blue is low, red is high. There are seven standard deviations across that map. And for those of you who don't know the North, the Virginia uh, space, um, the mountains are kind of up along the edge. Um, there are very high income groups in the high, in the blue area, the very low income groups. There are rural groups in the blue, yellow, and red areas. There are minority groups in the blue, yellow, and red areas. Um, there are tertiary care centers in the blue, yellow, and red areas. My question is, what's the pattern? But wait, now, I'll, I'll up the ante. Sometimes folks get it right, and thus far it has always been a student. I've been staring at this for years and just puzzled by it. I think we're starting to figure it out. But let's just, because we don't know, in fact. This is real data and a real issue. Anybody recognize the pattern? Do you mean? I've got to be related to hypertension. By a million hearts, we're taking folks in the blue area to teach folks in the red area about hypertension control. In fact, that's all I wonder if maybe we have it backwards because the folks in the red area see a lot more of it. Um, but it's, it's not related to health care. At least we can't spot it. Oh, 
so the question is smoking, and, and it turns out smoke, it's a great question. Smoking ethnicity doesn't correlate. Yeah, it re, and if you look at SES, it reduces the variation. It does not remove it. Okay, let's go add another piece of data. That's the North Carolina stroke map. It's somewhat different time period. I can get them to match. Uh, we only mapped a county. Okay. And we've been studying this map for a long time at the state level. Oh, shoot. It's, I mean, that's a poor, the top right, the dark red, is really an area that has major access. By the way, this is the area that got clobbered in part by the hurricane, as did the southern. Um, but it's, it's hard to make sense out of that map. Anybody? This is why, by the way, we're always going to need schools of public health. Uh, good question. This one, let me go back. I don't know if I have a pointer on this. I don't know. Let's see if I do. So that's D.C. metro area. That's Roanoke. That's Charlottesville. And that's Newport News, all big, big population areas of tertiary care centers. That's rural, that's rural, that's rural, that's rural, that's rural. But I'm going to move on to another map. The observation here is no health system has enough scale to see these patterns. So the idea that medical groups will figure this out and will actually, you can't see this in any health system. I mean, I work with a couple of these. I mean, this group and this group and this group, they're all going, oh, shoot, we got high hypertension rates, and this guy, this group is going, oh, man, we're good. Um, we got great care systems. Except I don't know if that's the care systems. So I've been using this. I've just been puzzled by it. And then a, a student who grew up in that area said, Dr. Mishra, it's the river basins. So if you take it, that's Roanoke. That's the Roanoke River Basin, that's the Chon River Basin, and they cross into North Carolina. And if you go back, and if you put the two on top of each other, it's a perfect match. And it carries, and that's actually the river basin going right through there, right like that. And if you ask me what's going on, I don't know. But there's something going on here and it goes back to the cockroach comment and the asthma comment about it's the probably something in the environment that we weren't able to see. And of course, we said, well, clearly it's access and clearly it's medications and clear. Well, it's not clearly any of those. There's something else going on here that we don't understand. And, fic and the amount of lo lives lost to early death and disability and the amount of dollars spent on that map. I mean, the dollars are in the billions. So there's a story to be figured out and told here yet, and I don't know the answer. Well, there's another story here that maybe you can elucidate on this, and that is, is that so these data are from 2005, 2009. How many years ago is that? How many years has this phenomenon been present? Yeah, yeah. Good. So, so everybody, can, so I mean, this is, I'm dealing with old data, um, time, badly time delayed, um, and it's actually hard to get this data. So, but that, what if we could get more accurate data that flows? We might be able to understand the patterns better. Everyone agree? So, by the way, we don't know the answer to this, but we sure are, and we're working on it. So, let's go to another map. Uh, that one. So this is colorectal cancer uh, rates. These are clusters of low and high mortality rates in the U.S. from 1970 to 2009. This is from American Cancer Society. Have any of you seen this before? It's really shaking up the, the oncology world because we have maps like this for the major cancers. They're all different, by the way. There's no, but what's, what's going on here? So it's screening, so screening matters. Of course, if you, if you die unscreened, 
I actually don't remember exactly how they calculated these maps. It's a good question. It sure looks like rivers, doesn't it? It's, it's having, this map is having some major policy effect because you know, up here we're talking about universal screening, universal policies, um, but in fact it's, we're now going, hmm, maybe we need to concentrate our efforts on the hotspots. One for screening, but the other is, you know, these look like, and by the way, there's Southern Virginia again. There's something funky going on here. So the American Cancer Society, National Cancer Institute, now have new requirements saying you gotta be working with communities and you actually need to be looking at outreach and data gathering because we need to be targeting our efforts around the clusters rather than act, uh, pretending everybody is the same and rates are alike. We were talking a little earlier and, and uh, some of us that have worked more in the cardiovascular area, you know about the coronary valley concept which runs from upstate New York down the Ohio River Valley and into the lower Mississippi River Valley and actually crosses some of these areas. So this is the idea. What we're seeing is, one, the idea of precision medicine, of which this is a form. Let's target our efforts based on, not necessarily where the genetics, because I'm not sure that's going to help us a whole lot, but where the clusters are. The other idea that's coming up here is the idea of precision public health. Let's look at the patterns. We need the data so we can see the shifting patterns. I don't think anybody anticipated this, this shift in patterns of illness, but it's going on. OK, one more. Um, of course. You know, if you look at that and you wonder about, uh, I mean, we talk about geographic factors, things in the earth, things in the water. If those don't change suddenly, I wonder how much of this is really socioeconomic. It's a, it, it's a great question, though. Again, you know your SAS data, then why isn't that a bigger cluster? There's a little bit there. Yeah, it's clear. It's probably multifactor. By the way, the other point to make: anybody knows the date on this? This stuff is this. This is part of the momentum driving medicine and public health together. Is we're getting large scale data, and we're going, huh? Don't know what to make of that. Okay, I have one final one, and I don't know what this one is either. So, oops, sorry. That's it. That one. Change in female mortality rates from 1992-96 to 2002-06 and 06. Blue is better, red is worsening. It's half the U.S. Mortality rates for women are worsening. What's the pattern? Hmm? It looks like SES has something to do with it. But look at California and Texas. And the North, I mean, the short answer is we don't know. But I guess what the reason I'm showing you these, one, they're interesting, and especially for a public health interest, but it's of interest to in medicine and public health because the, the amount of lives lost early the amount of money spent as we move into macro and value-based care, our ability to intervene is going to be driven in large part by our ability to have access to this data and to target our, our work together. And we cannot do it separately. So I don't know the, and uh, there, we have lots of these. And uh, we very, very rarely have an answer. I mean, the data I showed you on uh, asthma in, in Cleveland is actually the exception. Um, we have some examples in Durham I can show you. We can show a sustained improvement, but those are still the uncommon example. What we need is your skills, the data, and the medical community working together to figure this out. And I don't know any other way we're going to be able to in intervene except together. Mickey?
Well, can folks hear Mickey's comment? It's a really important one. To what extent are the folks who care about business, which is like every elected official, um, paying attention to this and weighing into that space? And the answer is it was uncommon before, but as, as governors, state policy wonks start looking at this going, oh, well, wait a minute. And in fact, the National Academy for State Health Policy, which I've learned to love, uh, um, the first time I went there, I think I was the second doc in the audience. Um, they weren't quite sure why I was there. Is they're saying, wait, why are we doing this? So especially under the Affordable Care Act, the states have more ability, especially if you're a SIM state, to, do, to move money around and to shift. And states are starting to do that. You're one, Rhode Island's doing even more. To say, okay, how do we do the interventions to actually shift some of those dollars around? It's, and it's being driven in large part because of business interest, saying we want the people in this state to be healthy. Back to the very beginning of this slide, because healthy people who live long, healthy lives are good for everyone, including those, and they make pe other people want to move there. They want businesses to come in there. So the Governor's Association is paying attention to this. This is why I don't think this is a flash in the pan. I think this is the ability to get the data. The Affordable Care Act and its policy levers is driving us to work together. And I'm really here representing the medical community saying we need your help. And, and it's going to change public health because we're the medical groups are picking up some of these skills. It's going to change primary care, which hasn't always been happy about these changes because we're having to think outside our exam rooms and partner. And it's as awkward on that side as it is on the other because we need each other. And most of all, our patients and communities need us. And to finish on Anne's last point, that's also, I'm going to end on diversity because this is actually a newly released map of how people live in my neighborhood, my community. And it goes between 77 years, which is where that the project I showed you is, uh, to 88 years. And I think that's three miles apart. So, uh, and this map is known to our policy leads and our elected officials. So finding out a solution to this is something that matters locally and matters reached in the states. It matters nationally. It matters to everybody in this room. And I think I'm actually a little bit early, but I'm happy to keep doing questions, but I promise that I would not talk at you too much, and I hope I've lived up to that. So. <laughs> happy to, happy to ask, answer other questions. I ran out slides. Well, I have 200 more, but I didn't, so, so yeah. One thing that intrigues me about this, from our perspective, the relationship we're talking about, just the two entities getting together, the relationship, we talk about the relationship changing each of them, and I think we're all very conscious of what's happened in the healthcare arena, but how do you see this actually changing what we do in public health? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, well, yeah, but I may be quickly disinvited. Um, there's something called speaking truth to power. Um, my experiences with doing these is when medical groups and public health groups first get together, they have a race as to who is most is least loved. I told John this. It's, it's a contest. I hope I would. I hate to win, um, but actually, there's a certain amount of of energy that goes into why each group feels unappreciated and disincluded. I think the next phase after that, um, assuming you get past it, is actually realizing you have a lot to learn together, but you're going you're to give up some. And the giving up is a little bit painful. Um, it means that healthcare has to, the family docs have to say, I'm going to trust a community health worker or a health, department, a health department funded community health worker to follow up on my patients, even though I never see that person. And that I'm going to, uh, um, and I'm going to share data with them, not always knowing how that data is going to be used. I mean, it's a trust issue. Public health, to your question, means not all the epidemiologists, not all the informaticians, not all the analyst and analysis is going to be done on the health on the public health side. In fact, health systems are fiercely protective of that data, as you know. So, actually, a lot of the data aggregation we're doing nationally, we're having the health system do the analysis to avoid the HIP issues, which are sometimes more apparent than real. But to get it done, we're doing the analysis there, and, and health systems are bringing up very big analytic teams to do it. So that means that some of the things that have traditionally been public health will now be owned, in fact, it's part or in large part by the health systems. It's, we're moving into a hybrid. Um, the thing that worries me the most, though, 
is if I look at schools of public health that are engaged in this work, and I think John knows this, we actually checked with the Associated Schools of Public Health and we looked how many. Oh dear, there was, what, nine months ago? How many schools of public health actually are engaged in the redesign work that's being done on the health side? Care to guess? That we could spot, and maybe we didn't ask the question right. 58, how many of the 58 are engaged in this sort of redesign work? Guys, this is not good. How many health systems are designed, or schools of medicine and health systems are designed in, in population health and redesign? Every single one of them. So I actually worry, um, and I think what requires this public health is not that being I me mean, you have so many folks to teach and you have so much work to do that's so important, but it actually means getting in the middle of all that, just like primary care has to get out of its comfort zone and come meet you halfway. It's actually doing exactly what you did. It's actually coming for sometimes awkward conversations about, okay, it's like long lost family members you didn't know you had and you, and you discover you have a common parents, which actually is true for primary care and public health if you go back to Rockefeller. Um, and then we actually need to work together again. So my. I think what it's going to do is require that you get out and do some bridge building, and I hope primary care and health systems will meet you half the way, at least half the time. But we've got to do it, folks. All right. Let me challenge you a bit. Please. Slides like this always worry me. You know, the, the availability of big data allows us to ask questions like this and segment Oh. Units. So, you know, when I see things like this, and I say, my goodness, I want to live where an 88 year is a life expectancy, and you look five years later, it's, and it's, it's 71. It's random variation, yeah. So the smaller the unit, yeah. the more available the data. You know, these are what we're seeing. One simple number here. It's hundreds of courses. Oh. And I just share, for those who couldn't hear, actually let me state it a little bit more boldly if I could. One of the, the, the big problems I see is that doctors are visual, we like maps, and we immediately look at that and one assume it's real. I mean, the data was that reliable and valid, that's correctly de depicted, and that the patterns are stable, none of which may be true. Um, the other one is, to put it another way, and we do cluster analysis, the most common issue we see is that the medical groups assume we, we understand that the cluster is real as opposed to random and that we think we know why. And that I think part of the, the what's required on the medical groups when we have to change is actually a bit of humbleness that actually we may not, we don't actually know, most of us, how to do a cluster analysis and when the, when the data, what the degree of reliability of that pattern is. We need your help on that. But that's not the hardest. The worst one is we actually think we know what the data means. And I have to tell you, as somebody who's been doing this wrong, I'm almost always wrong. Um, and that degree of knowing, of not putting medical interpretations on, on big data is something that doctors have to learn to let go of. So I would share your concern. Ah. Oh, it's a wonderful question. Training in, in your own environment, and there's a documented decrease in empathy over training. And this, these questions seem to require a lot of empathy in order to be able to address them. So, we need to do some work to support. So, well. absolutely, we need to support the work of trainees. But I would turn it around, because um, actually, what we've seen in the coalitions, it's the young folk who have the energy and see the patterns. 
the medical groups and even the public health groups have been socialized to only see some things. In fact, what has struck me that I did not anticipate is the enthusiasm that students and residents bring to this process. I mean, take the Duke Family Medicine Residency Program as an example. We have 700 and some applicants for five positions because we know we're going to require they learn to be good family docs and they're also going to learn how to work on this. It, we did not make it easier. And the response from the applicant pool has been, this is why we went to medical school. We want to be really good family docs, but we want to know that we're making a difference in our community. So I'm actually more worried about how we protect that enthusiasm. Um, but my other observation, because I got a bunch of young, eager folks, is actually my main job is keeping out of their way. So I think, putting it another way, I think the young folks are going to teach us. And what I'd ask of those of you who are students and residents is don't let people tell you you can't do this. In fact, to take it one more, would anyone, I mean, doing this national work, would anyone care to guess how big the Duke team is that does all this work? Anyone? Hmm? It's three people. Now, we have lots of partners, and, but in fact, that's the tale, is that this is not about what you do. It's about who you know to work with, because this is about relationships and partnership and sharing. You don't have to do it all yourself, and in fact, there's no way you can. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you. If you want to come and ask uh, Lloyd some questions, or still snacks in the back, uh, everyone's welcome. And I'll turn off the microphone so you can ask me really good questions. <laughs>